Okay, hello everybody. I'm going to keep this uh, as swift as possible, hopefully in about 40 minutes or so. So you've been nagging me about some of my research. So this is just a quick run through. I'm not going to go in depth particularly today. I'm just going to give you a quick run through comparing really Gebekli Tepe and the other sites in this area and other parts of Turkey with other sites around the world, particularly Peru, Mexico, Indonesia and a few other places. Um, obviously in this image here we can see the Rapa Nui Moai. This is a head from Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. This obviously is one of the pillars at Gebekli Tepe. I'm utterly convinced that there was um, an elite in prehistory whose symbol was the serpent. There's a big debate about what the serpent means, but I think it's partly, not entirely, not just to do with wisdom, but to do with earth energies and working with the natural energies of the earth at these particular places to help with fertility, to help with crops, and to help with altered states of consciousness. Uh, but we'll get into that briefly as we go through the talk. So we're quickly going to go through some of these. Um, the game changer that is Gebekli Tepe. Some earthworks I want to look at first. There's some very interesting uh, anomalies with those. Uh, spirals, cut marks, rock art and different things. We've seen some of those today, obviously, and yesterday. Uh, and various other things, but most notably giants and the elongated headed people. Or the cone heads, as some people call them. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of strange worldwide connections. For example, we find giants all over the world, like these two examples here. This is actually, does anyone know where this is? Any other guesses? Any, any other guesses? It's not that at all. This is actually one of the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. This is what gets people. They don't realise that the two, not the Great Pyramid, the other two pyramids on the Giza Plateau are actually covered in granite, the polygonal wall style, like we find in Peru and Bolivia. And a lot of people don't realise that you get the same puffiness, you get the same beautiful cut, sort of you know, almost like cushion or pillow type puffiness. You get the protrusions that some people call knobs, but us English find that funny when we say that. Um, and obviously we have this earth grid as well, which I've done a small book about a few years ago, which connects many of these sites around the world. This is just an interesting starting point here. Obviously we've got Giza here, but over in America, in Ohio, a place called Newark, there's some brilliant mega earthworks that stretch across the entire landscape in that particular area. I visited there in 2012 uh, when I was researching um, for the giants and uh, other parts of research I've been doing. This is one of the, the great, oops a daisy, um, I've turned something off, oh there we go. And uh, this, is one, this is one, it's so large they built an entire golf course within one of the circles. Um, and now it's really confusing because you can't tell what's ancient and what's a golf course, um, which is one of the issues archaeologists will no doubt have in about a thousand years' time. Uh, this just shows you the geometry. It's like a sort of um, flattened octagon. But it's the orientation which really interests me. This is the main circle. This is the octagon. This is the golf course. And uh, basically it's an entire town has been built over it and there's other earthworks stretching over the whole area. Uh, but this orientation is very interesting because if you extend that all the way around over just about just over 6,000 miles, you hit perfectly the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Now you do. It's absolutely precise. Uh, and this is the line if you draw it across the earth. And that's following the big circle? Uh, the big circle. One of, yeah. yeah, one of, one of the great earth circles of the planet, which is the, there's potentially millions. And you can see the earthwork and the detail there. And similar, similar uh, earthworks with very interesting geometry, similar to what we find in Ohio and other parts of uh, North America. Obviously, we get these in Britain as well. Are being found in the Amazon. This is the Brazilian part of the Amazon. This was actually a BBC TV program that was on about three years ago. And you can see some of the earthworks here. But what it is, is the only reason they've discovered these is because they've been cutting down the rainforest. So in a bizarre twist, some brilliant archaeology and ancient, uh, ancient construction has been discovered. What really interests me is that some of the geometries are very sophisticated. They use specific measuring systems. And also this one here, for those that know the work of Alexander Tom, there's even someone related to him over there. This is a flattened bee. Anyone know what a flattened bee is? 
It's basically one of the uh, several types of stone circle geometries that Alexander Tom discovered when he was surveying the sites in the 1950s and 60s across Britain. He discovered, he, he surveyed accurately uh, 300 sites, came up with these three or four of potentially five different shapes, and this was one of them. And why is this being found in the Amazon? This is what really intrigues me. And I've showed this to my archaeoastronomer friend, Stuart Mason, who's um, also very compelled by this. This is Portsmouth, Ohio. This is just an artist's interpretation of what these earthworks look like. But these are massive, absolutely outrageously big. This is it here. Ignore this one for a moment. Don't look at this one. Look at this one. Uh, this is uh, at least, I think it's over a mile and a half long. This is an earthwork that went through a river continued, you had this huge kind of almost like octopus head here with these two eyes, these other avenues going off, and then this one coming down here with this almost like Atlantis looking kind of multiple concentric circle. And these were filled with water, these were all filled with the river water, and a large mound in the middle, there's another mound here, you get more over here, and this is about, uh, this is at least a mile and a half or two miles long. This is what Avebury may have looked like in England. This is Portsmouth, Ohio. This is Avebury in England. So we see immediate similarities, but this was made with megaliths, 50 ton megaliths, some of these, hundreds if not thousands of them, potentially over the whole landscape of Silbury Hill here. So we're finding these strange anomalies in different parts of the world, just one of many. So I'm just gonna jump to Malta. I spent two months in Malta and Gozo earlier this year, just living there basically. Um, this is my friend actually Stuart Mason, I, I visited there with him in 2007. These are some of the very strange loaf skulls they call them, which look like, not, not dissimilar to the elongated skulls you find in uh, Peru and others, but they're, they're different, they don't go up so much, they kind of go back like it's a loaf of bread, um, hence the name. These have all disappeared now, there's none left, uh, there were thousands of them discovered in the Hypogeum, which is the underground megalithic temple there. This is some other sites here, you can see the beautiful kind of stonework, almost polygonal, beautifully put together. We see the spiral carvings, which we'll come on to shortly. But this one here is particularly interesting to me because we find one almost identical to that in Tiwanaku in Peru. But before we go to Peru, I made a quick discovery when I was out there. There's on Gozo here, this is um, Malta, this is Gozo, this is Camino. On Gozo up here, I stayed at a place called Jara or Zagra, spelt. And there's a site called Gigantia, or Gigantia, which is a megalithic site. It's huge monoliths, up to 100 tons, some of the stones, beautifully made. Kind of got this rough hewn look. It's a free, it was the oldest freestanding temple in the world until Gebekli Tepe came along and stole its thunder. But it's still about six or 7,000 years old. This is a, a dolmen called the Sansuna Dolmen. That is just a bit further away, and it perfectly aligns. You have the Sansuna Dolmen there, Gigantia there. It goes all the way through Camino, and meets sorry, meets here. Now, sorry, down here, a Bugibel, which is other megalithic site, and this is oriented towards Gigantia and the Sansuna Dolmen. There's quite an interesting story with Gigantia. It's said it was built by the goddess Sansuna. These are old traditions you find all over Malta and Gozo. And she was said to have built many of the megalithic sites, but most notably Gigantia or Gigantia. But also this Sansuna dolmen was supposedly dropped there by her when she was walking along this particular line on the way to Gigantia to build that itself when she was building that. She dropped that on the way. So it's quite interesting that they're in alignment with each other. There's, a, there's more research on this, but I'm not going to get into it in great detail. This just shows you the dolmen. It's like a fallen capstone. You have to climb over a metal fence to get in there. This is Gigantia. Absolutely amazing site. Uh, one of my favourites, in fact. Um, and this is the Bugiba Temple, which has actually now had a, an entire hotel complex built around it. And now this is just one of their garden ornaments. But it's been left there in its proper position and uh, the heritage people of Malta protected that. But what's interesting about Gigantia specifically, there's other sites obviously all over Malta, it's the oldest one there. No one knows where the pre-culture came from for it, although there was said to be a land bridge between Gozo and Sicily, where you find other megalithic sites. And also, this, as Andrew mentioned to me recently, they found this huge monolith under the water between, uh, just off the coast of Sicily, possibly on the way to Gozo. But what's interesting here is that this is, um, one of the stones, and you can see the serpent, this is from Gigantia in the museum there. 
And this is obviously one from Gebekli Tepe. Now, not saying they're the same people who built them, but there are remarkable similarities when we start looking at the details and what's left there. Um, but these serpents keep coming up in different places around the world. I think Gebekli Tepe is probably the most significant, but they're all over Peru and Bolivia. Uh, many different parts of the world we'll get into briefly. But these one, this one really caught my attention because it's got a very similar style. Look, it's, like, it's like a thin pillar, and it's sort of long one way, and you get the same style here. Again, we even get uh, speculatively almost like T-shaped pillars at Gigantia and ho lots of hold stones and cut marks, which is exactly what we get at Gebekli Tepe, which is obviously this one here. Uh, there's me and Andrew and Graham and me posing um, a couple of years ago when we first came here. Uh, this just shows you the site before it had the roof on it. And uh, this is just one of the strange statues found in the area, which I didn't see on the museum. I think it's in a different part of Turkey. And then we get onto the stonework, which really intrigues me. Because um, this is obviously what we, we've seen already. We saw uh, a reproduction of that, obviously, at the museum. These are other versions, uh, sort of other carvings, relief carvings from Gebekli. Um, and one of the things I noticed was, uh, I did, did a little bit of, geod I'm quite into geodesy or, or earth measure measurements around the world and the relationship, the spatial relationship between sites around the world. Uh, but it's kind of earth grids type stuff. Uh, and I found this weird one because we know that um, Gebekli Tepe is called the Navel or Potbelly Hill. And the same thing you get in Cusco, the Coracantia, where it's called Navel or the Navel of the World, the Belly Button of the World. And there's very similar names, as Andrew mentioned in one of his lectures, all around the world. Easter Island, you get a similar thing as well. And then I, I just did a, did a little bit of um, stuff on Google Earth, found that from Gebekli Tepe, the main enclosure, enclosure D, I think all the way down to the exact centre of the Coracantia in Peru, found to be 7928 miles, which really, I, I knew, when I measured it, I kind of knew that number. And it's basically the equatorial diameter of the planet. So if you draw a line from one surface there to a surface on the other side, roughly at the equator, that's the distance you get. It could have been 7920 miles, which is the canonical diameter. This is like an ancient tradition, which is something that John Michel and others, and John Neal are really into, where you find harmonic number systems encoded within the Earth's sphere. And to so get 7920, interestingly, just as a side note, 8 times 9 times 10 times 11 equals that number. So you find these harmonic uh, divisions and multiplications. And the fact that we find the canonical diameter or the diameter of the earth encoded on the surface of the earth between two major temple sites around the planet is to me very very intriguing or a brilliant coincidence we saw this today we saw the actual one of these today Andrew uh, pointed this out to me that some of the heads we find at Tiwanaku in the sunken temple are said to represent all the different um, peoples of the planet at the time that's the kind of tradition that's now spouted there and again we find strange similarities with the heads discovered at Gebekli Tepe and obviously we get the H blocks and the H symbols this is the Puma Punku which is next to Tiwanaku in Bolivia and this obviously is one of the main pillars at the Gebekli Tepe and obviously this is H and this is U and what's that spell? You. Thank you <laughs> And then we find different, these, are th these top ones here, this one is uh, from Silistani. In fact, these are all from Silistani, what am I saying? Do you see these carvings here? These are all from these towers, these funerary towers we find at Silistani in, in Peru. Uh, around Lake Titicaca, there's another site called Cotimbo. But look, you see this one here? These sort of relief carving, you see almost like the fox-like thing from Gebekli Tepe, lizards. Uh, other things here. There's many of these. Andrew had a good look at these with, with me in June. Uh, there's a beetle here. <laughs> this is the site called Kutimbo. Uh, this is another site further around Lake Titicaca. You get these very unusual square town with these polygonal puffy walls. This is a circular one. And we have these what looks like, a, uh, I think is a puma. Another one here. And these sort of two little beings emerging from the rock coming towards you which is very odd, because it looks, uh, I will jump onto that, so it looks very similar to the, the belly of the totem pole that we saw in the museum today, emerging from the belly. Uh, these are some close-ups of Katimbo, we get serpents all over the place. And then we get this 3D one, this 3D critter, which looks really similar to the one walking down the, the, the pillar, the, the thin part of the pillar at Gebekli. 
And here's just a few other comparisons. Uh, not, this is just purely speculative. There's probably thousands of years difference between some of these sites, but it's worth taking note of these. This is obviously what we saw today uh, from Gobekli Tepe. This is actually the first, I believe, the first stone discovered um, back in the 60s. I think it's correct. They found it on top uh, of the hill there. This is obviously Gobekli Tepe. This is Costa Rica. So even in Costa Rica, in the area where them stone spheres were discovered, we find uh, similar relief carvings. This is Silastani. This is Silastani. And this is another area pearl called, um, oh, what the hell is that place called? It's where that wacky, wacky skeleton was discovered. It's basically near, it's basically, it used to be a megalithic site. And on the mountain, the Viracocha mountain nearby in the Sacred Valley, they found this amazing elongated skull there. This is a couple of other examples we find in various parts of Peru, probably from a later culture. This is the Costa Rica one, and it's on the edge of this huge board. It's like stone board, which they believed may have been a burial covering. But we find these strange, beautifully carved. This is like sort of very hard, very hard basalt. Next, to, this is the same culture that potentially constructed these stone spheres. Obviously, we find serpents everywhere. These are the ones just on the streets of Cusco. Uh, this is on the sort of the, the Coricancha area. And this is Navali Chori, we saw that today as well. Um, just the back of the head, this beautiful kind of serpent, which is very unusual looking. I wonder if anyone knows what, do you know what sort of snake that is, Andy? It's a mystical one, huh? Yeah, okay, okay. But you get these all over, all over Cusco, just along the streets of Peru. Um, this is obviously Earth for Man. This is a statue actually in the Costa Rica Museum as well, next to them other relief carvings on that board and the stone spheres. Strangely similar. What's, what intrigues me is the hands. They kind of go into the navel, groinal area, but also it's like on a stump, similar to what we find here. So it's obviously planted at a very specific place. Um, it's part of, obviously part of some kind of ceremonial complex. This is just a strange thing Andy sent me actually uh, from Mexico which has uh, similarities, especially with the sort of V-neck here, or the beak. And then we find, uh, this has been pointed out by several different people over the years, uh, we find the hands of the Easter Island Moai going towards the navel, pointing to the navel. And we find kind of similar things at Tiwanaku here. And this is uh, in Sulawesi, uh, in the Bada Valley in Indonesia. We find a very similar thing to what we find um, in uh, Earth for Man, where it's touching his parts. Uh, but we find this very odd, very abstract, I'm very intrigued by this, this very abstract, odd carvings of the face, almost like a plectrum or something. But they're so beautifully done, they almost look like they're done on a computer. It's really bizarre. Uh, it really intrigues me how beautiful some of them are. And this is in Colombia, a place called San Augustin. And we find uh, similar things to what we find in Indonesia, the very sort of beautifully sort of abstract carved faces here as well. And they're kind of putting their hands in strange positions. This is the gold artifact which is on display at the Bogota Museum. Uh, and these are some examples some of the hands around the world. There's been, you've probably seen these before. Um, obviously, uh, Earth for Man, Gobekli Tepe, Easter Island. This is like a broken Moai. Uh, here, here as well on Easter Island, Tiwanaku, and I think these are in Japan. Japan? Yes. And then we have the um, uh, phenomena of the uh, Keystone Cuts. Well, I thought I'd just steal off the internet rather than go through 20 different slides. Uh, someone put this together. We saw the, and then I saw these in Angkor Wat. You see them at, in Peru and Bolivia, in Egypt, in Rome, in Etruscan sites. And obviously at many of these sites, or even in France, but, but it is thought now in Turkey. I'm not sure where exactly that is. Um, where would that be in Turkey, I wonder? Ethiopia, you find keystone cuts. Uh, Romania, Cambodia, and so on and so forth. But even though these were used potentially thousands of years ago, at places like Tiwanaku, the Romans did it as well. So we know that the Romans used this technology. It's almost like a sort of stonemason's craft was passed down or stolen over many, many generations. And we get the cut marks, like we saw yesterday at Gobekli Tepe. We find these uh, specifically around northern Britain and Scotland and other places. This is a place called Clover Cairns. Um, and we find this is actually at Tiwanaku. 
this could be from Tiwanaku or Pumapunku. We do find some examples on Easter Island, on some of the uh, lower platforms. Obviously at Gebekli Tepe in the bedrock and on top of the pillars. So this is a very unusual phenomenon which Andy talked about um, over the last couple of days as well. But we do find it in many different places and there's no explanation for it. It's a very, very strange stump. Even hold stones, this is just a weird one, I wanted to throw this in here, because this is actually in New Hampshire. This is the famous Menon Toll down in Cornwall. Um, this is one in New Hampshire, which I've not been able to locate. I've been, look, I've been around New Hampshire searching for this, and it's, not, it's probably in someone's garden. Um, but not dissimilar uh, to what we saw in the museum earlier, the, uh, the sort of, uh, almost like the, the, um, the ring, the stone ring. Spirals, these are everywhere, obviously. Uh, this is the classic ones from Newgrange. These are from Scotland, these beautifully carved stone spheres. This is actually from Cambridgeshire, a Neolithic, from where I'm from, Cambridgeshire, uh, found not far from Willingham. This is uh, Long Meg, uh, which is up in Cumbria. And we find them around the world. This is in Sardinia. These are carvings that have been, uh, got ochre on them as well. We even find stone spheres in Sardinia, the sort of almost pyramid type structures and these amazing towers and these very odd kind of tombs behind these semicircular um, uh, enclosures and giants are all over Sardinia. There's been a lot of research done on them um, and even a TV show came out about it recently. And this is the one I mentioned, the, tr the quadruple spiral, which is exactly like the one we saw in Malta. This, is a t this was discovered at Puma Punku, in fact, not at Tiwanaku, which I originally thought it was actually at Puma Punku, which is next to Tiwanaku. This is what Tiwanaku actually used to look like. It used to be like this sort of 100 or 99 monoliths in a huge rectangle around this raised enclosure. And we find secret spirals all over Tiwanaku and Puma Punku. These tiny little sort of serpents and spirals all over the place, which I believe are on the back of walls, and they were like the signatures of the builders. And we find obviously these in different parts of the world, which does suggest um, there might be more to this than meets the eye. Plus we find this um, relief carving of a frog here, or a lizard of some sort, whatever that is. We find the lightning, which is something that is part of the, the very ancient tradition of um, Viracocha, who was said to be able to summon lightning, change the weather etc. Also, which you get, very, you get the similar shamanic traditions also in North America. And it's this close up of something you can't really see properly. <laughs> and then we have these. These are the sort of Atlanteans that guard the gates of Puma Punku and Tiwanaku, which are now outside a church in Tiwanaku. And then you get these brilliant elongated skulls, very huge cranial capacity, very powerful jaws as well. And also this was discovered, and Andrew and I had a good look at this in June, it was, it's been on display again for the first time in several years, and it's called the Fuente Magna Bowl, which was discovered next to Lake Titicaca, about 20 miles from Tiwanaku. And um, it has a Mara script on it, which is the local native script. It has Proto-Sumerian and Sumerian script. And it's been dated by various people to be, around, to be written in a certain type of Sumerian language, going back to 2500 to 3000 BC. But, uh, it could be a hoax, so we're not sure about it at this present moment. Um, but it's a very elaborate one, considering it was found in the 1950s. But if it isn't a hoax, it does suggest that there was cross-cultural contact between the Middle East and Peru at least two and a half thousand years uh, BC, which is very interesting to say the least. We find more um, examples of sp double spirals. Serpents, this strange, looks, almost looks like the head of the lady of um, um, Gebekli Tepe. We find other spirals here, polygonal walls, a beautiful place called Chinchero, which is near Oyente Tambo in Peru. Uh, we find other examples. This is actually found at what's called the, Viracocha, the mountain of Viracocha in the Sacred Valley. We find relief carving spirals, very strange, trepan skulls and elongated skulls. And this was very famous, it was in the news all over the Daily Mail and all these different newspapers a few years ago called the Waki skeleton, which is um, potentially they think, thought was an alien skeleton. And again, this is Silistani again, but we find serpent carvings there as well. These strange carvings and elongated skulls, and again, the relief carvings that we saw briefly earlier. And we even find these, these spirals in Mexico as well. This is a place called Quilquilco, in just, uh, just near Mexico City. Um, this is a beautiful uh, circular pyramid. It's quite rare <coughs> for Mexico. 
And it's potentially the oldest pyramid there. There's a dating of the lava flow next to it, which goes back to 7,000 years, although that's been uh, disputed by various uh, researchers since that initial discovery. We're actually visiting there in February uh, with Brian Forrester, if anyone would like to join us. And this is uh, obviously the tradition of Quetzalcoatl, who was this sort of plumed serpent. He was the great god of Mexico, who arrived uh, on the Gulf Coast, in Olmec land really, and in prehistory on a raft of serpents with his band of followers. He was a tall gentleman, fair skinned, bearded into all the arts of civilization and culture. And he spread throughout the Americas. Potentially he was Viracocha in, in, um, in uh, Peru and Bolivia. He was Bochica in, in Colombia. And he could have had uh, different representations up in North America as well. This is the area where he actually landed. It's called uh, the Olmec world, really. This is a place called La Benta. This is, this is officially the oldest pyramid in the Americas. Uh, it was built around 1800 BC. We find the huge Olmec heads. We find these basalt columns. These, and these huge African or Polynesian looking chaps. Um, 17 of those have been discovered. We also find this statue here with the bags. And then we find this, it's this close-up of it, but we also find similar bags, and there's me holding a bag. And we find this not only in Gebekli Tepe, which Andrew doesn't believe are bags, I think there's pens for animals, as you can see here, but we find them all over Sumerian uh, statues as well, and in different parts of the world. But this is a brilliant thing. It's supposed to be some guy riding inside this kind of serpent. It's almost like a machine. And this is, this is some of the examples. And you have these bearded figures, which you don't get naturally bearded people in Mexico. So this, and sort of people believe that Quetzalcoatl may have not been from that area, may have came from somewhere else, potentially uh, Europe or the Middle East. Uh, we find the same thing in Peru and Bolivia. We have the stories of Viracocha, which are identical to Quetzalcoatl. They mean pretty much the same thing. There's references to serpents and plumed serpents. And it also translates as foam of the sea, suggesting he had a, pow a powered motorboat uh, and foam was, would occur from that. Or it could be the sort of primal foam of creation. This just shows you Tiwanaku. And he, he arrived and emerged from Lake Titicaca onto the island of the sun, created a race of giants and built all the megalithic sites in Peru and Bolivia along this straight line called the Path of Viracocha, which is very intriguing. And all along this line, elongated skulls have been found at virtually every site along the way. This is actually the island of the sun, the place of emergence of Viracocha. Uh, and you can see like almost like a dolmen there, which is what we see uh, in Europe. And this is actually a dolmen in North America. This is a place called um, North Salem in New York State. Has anyone been here? Yes. Yes, good, good. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable site. Um, you can see the size of it compared to this car here, uh, but it's between, there's estimates between 60 and 90 tons. Uh, it's not from the area of this stone, it's, this is probably a glacial erratic. And these are five stones here, which are perfectly balancing this, absolutely perfectly, it's just precision. But this whole area here, this is a very powerful zone of geology. There's two different types of geology meet here. And right below this is a huge negative magnetic anomaly. So this was placed here deliberately and to harness the energies. You, not only do you get the natural energies, you get the piezoelectrical effect, the weight of this rock touching these. And there's been tests done here where when you place your seeds underneath them, uh, it charges up the seeds at certain times of day. And when you go and plant the seeds, you get a much higher yield, 300% increase sometimes, and a stronger frost resistant crop. And so this is one of the secrets of the ancients. And just simple dolmens could do that. Hence, that's why they're probably everywhere on the planet. And it's probably people like Viracocha, Quetzalcoatl, and others, and this elite who probably began at Gobekli Tepe, traveling around the world teaching this knowledge. These are some examples from around the world here. Even in, um, you get these beautiful ones in uh, China. And then you have these very strange mummified figures, uh, these beings who had clearly had ginger and red hair with fair skin, there were, some of them were six foot eight, uh, and, and they potentially built these pyramids as well that are in China. And these date to roughly 2800 BC. There's been recent uh, testing done on them because they were perfectly mummified. And then we find this strange old image from the ninth century of some ginger haired dude uh, with white skin who looks blue eyes, clearly Caucasian, 
who was one of the great teachers of, in the Buddhist tradition. <laughs> so you have these weird anomalies uh, popping up. You also get dolmens uh, in Colombia, perfectly European dolmens in Colombia at San Augustine, the same place we saw them strange statues. But this was earlier, this is an earlier level, this is a lower level at the same site as we found those very intricate statues. So you get perfect passage grave dolmen type creations even in Colombia, suggesting a global connection. And you get the same kind of story with Bochica, who was emerged, he, he came uh, from the north, I believe, and he founded civilization in Colombia, the same way Viracocha did in South America and Quetzalcoatl did in Central America, with all very similar traits as we have found with the others. And this is a, uh, an old image of him and a great big statue in the town centre. And even in, um, all through Colombia, you find evidence or carvings of elongated skulls, but it's such a humid climate there, there's not many skeletal remains to work with. But we see evidence even at San Augustine, you find it as well with the sort of elongated skulls, and even the sort of classic trait of holding the staffs, which we find in different parts of the world. And this one as well. Either it's either that or it's just a really cool hat. Uh, it's all in Colombia, San Augustine, southern Colombia. This, and so you see the similarities here with Sulawesi in Indonesia. This is an old photo, but look at the sort of abstract, sort of almost computerized art. I love that. I just, I'm, I'm so intrigued by this place, but it's so incredibly difficult to get to. Uh, but we're working on it. And for some reason, I put the same picture in again from three slides ago. Yes, and so, yeah, we saw that here at San Augustine in Columbia, holding the two staffs. We find the same, similar thing here in England, the long man of Wilmington in Sussex. Tiwanaku, you have the Viracocha holding the two staffs. And these are both from Bogota Museum in Colombia, which to me, they're surveying sticks. They're clearly what surveyors would use, and they would place them through the landscape to <coughs> survey over great distances, you know, a primitive form. And then this is, the, this is from San Augustine, Colombia as well. And it's quite similar to some of the heads we find on East Run. It's only 3,000 miles away across the sea. So they could easily just get a canoe, pop over there, and the influence is obviously spread. Um, and we're jumping around a bit, so we're going to go to Russia next. The, I think Andrew might have shown some images of these very strange dolmens with these, what Andrew calls, soul holes uh, throughout. And these are impressive. Not only are they kind of puffy, polygonal look, like you find in Peru and Bolivia and Egypt and Turkey and other places, but they have these holes and they're brilliantly put together, aren't they? And uh, we, are, we are actually thinking of doing a trip up there. Uh, sort of we know some guys who live out there who do little, might be able to help us with a little trip if anyone's interested. Um, they're all in within a hundred mile area, I think. The ones, the, the main ones. I don't think it's, it's not a huge amount of, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of walking, I think. These are some more elaborate examples here. Beautiful, aren't they? And in that part of the world as well, you you. Yes, but you get more, they're, they're more like sort of candle entrances, aren't they? Rather than circles, yeah, yeah. But similar, similar. And, um, but even up that way, you find giant skeletons as well, which probably the guys have built them. Um, and this is just one example here, one found relatively recently, all the details there if you're interested. Um, but it just shows you that, I mean, just look at the size of that femur, that is insane. That's like a normal size femur, thigh bone, and that's a, one of the ones I found. So they wouldn't want to meet him. It's probably they were hiding in those dolmens, weren't they? Because the giants couldn't get in. Uh, just more examples up here. This is actually um, a 33-inch shin bone, um, which would suggest an extremely tall person. Uh, and, so, and now we're going to sort of jump into some um, polygonal architecture around the world. Uh, just a few examples here. This is obviously in Peru. Uh, this, anyone know where this is? I've got you last time, didn't I? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> While you dwell on that, I want to drink my cold tea. Sorry? No. Yep, there is one in Turkey, yeah, but that's not Turkey. No idea? England. That's me. <laughs> this is in Italy. Yeah, it's north of Rome 
We know where this is now. And this, where do you think this is? Nope. No. No. It's already been, we've already mentioned it in the lecture already. Yes, Easter Island, exactly. So this is some classic examples around Cusco with obviously elongated skull people. And you see the different qualities and different styles, later styles added to the top with these protrusions. Uh, this is the famous 12-sided stone, I believe, um, which is along just the outer wall of the Inca Roc Palace. Um, some beautiful, strange, ab abstract carvings with serpents here along the streets of Cusco again. There's me, very excited, um, at a place called Saxi Waman in, uh, up on the hills above Cusco. Unbelievably sized megaliths, just uh, some up to 100, 120, 150 tons, some of them. So something around that kind of size. And that just shows you, you know, and these were apparently twice as high as they are now, originally. And again, there's legends of giants saying they built those. You find similar construction at Machu Picchu. You also find, there's a few, we found a few reports of giant skeletons, um, you know, not too far from here. And this is the Temple of the Three Windows. I didn't put the really cool picture we got in, actually. Uh, but this is the, from inside the Temple of the Three Windows. You can see the polygonal architecture. Some of the, an earthquake or some earth movement has changed that slightly, knocked it out of place. This is Oyente Tambo, which is kind of on the way to Machu Picchu. Uh, and these are the beautiful um, red granite stone um, up on the top of this mountain. that actually came from that mountain over there, and they somehow dragged it five hours walk down the mountain, across a river, across swamps, and back up another mountain. And some of these are over 100 tonnes. Uh, more examples of the stonework here. And these are great big computer keyboard buttons we find as well, <laughs> all over Peru. So there's like the first computer. Again, Silistani has some evidence of uh, some polygonal stonework, but we find that more at Cutimbo. Uh, we find serpents all over the place here, and, and these sort of protrusions. This is actually a lizard here. We saw these earlier. Let's just show you some different angles. This is. Um, one of the square towers at Silistani, uh, which looks remarkably similar to this one on Easter Island. Almost identical, in fact, suggesting there was, they obviously were probably connected in one way or another. Uh, further uh, polygonal puffy stonework on Easter Island. Some oaf falling over near them. And then we find these statues again. These are the ones from uh, Tiwanaku here. Hang on a sec. Yes. This one here, so cut, cut in two, this is actually on Easter Island. And it's a kneeling figure, slightly looking upwards. Um, and you get almost identical ones we saw earlier outside the church at Tiwanaku. With the ribs, strange hats, and so forth. And even on Easter Island, giants have been reported, you know, saying that the, the first visitors there could walk between the legs of them, they were so tall, etc. And this is Giza in Egypt. This is the, which pyramid is this? The, 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 th the small one, the smallest one, yeah. And you can see the puppy stonework, the sort of protrusions here, some dude there. And this is inside the Valley Temple, which is beautifully cut stone. You can see the cornering here is very interesting. This is something, it's quite an unusual design feature, but we do find that in Peru meticulously as well. With the alabaster floor, this strange darker stone here. It looks like water's been in this whole temple for a very long time. And uh, this is again the cornering inside the Valley Temple, beautifully done. And again, we see this stonework here inside the Valley Temple, which is actually mirrored on the other side, or the opposite wall. It's exactly the same. All the stones mirror each other along the whole. Uh, this is in Valley Temple as well. These are all Valley Temple. Uh, in the Giza Plateau. Oh. Just, yeah, it's just yeah, it's just in front of everything. Uh, yeah, it's just to the le if you're looking at the Sphinx face on with the pyramids, and it's just to your left slightly. Yeah, partly. Yeah, they do that in the uh, Sphinx Temple as well, I think. And this is one of the skulls. Apparently, that was discovered. There's one of many. Uh, 
elongated skulls you find all over Egypt. This is, this is weird, this is a weird little story. This is a mummified giant's finger. Uh, that was found 100 miles, 100K north of Cairo by a guy called Gregor Spori, uh, about 2002, I think. And he got chatting with, I'm not sure of the you know, authenticity of this, but it has been x-rayed as well. He had to pay a couple of hundred bucks to get this former grave robber, or this sort of tomb robber, um, who was in his sort of 90s or something to have a look at this weird discovery he made. And he, she pulled out this box and it had this giant's finger in it, which is mummified. And it was so big that it would equal a person 16 foot tall, or he just had massive hands, uh, one or the other, we're not sure. But you can see the bone here. Apparently this was x-rayed and verified, and this, that, and the other, and uh, there's an Egyptian note there. So I'd be quite intrigued to go and, um, go and find that, and check it out. Then we have beautiful stonework here at the Assyrian Abydos, Egypt. Um, and again, you not only do you get the mega blocks precision carved, you actually get almost like polygonal stonework here with like the protrusions or the keyboard buttons, the, you know, or knobs on them. Um, and this is sunk so far down, this is obviously much older than the other part of the Abydos temple, which has now got green water in it at, at different times. And you can go down there. We will be visiting here next set, this time next year, actually, if anyone would like to join us. Me and Andrew are doing a tour there with the Kemet School. Uh, and we'll be going here, and we'll be going to Baalbek in Lebanon, and very o many other places. But look, you can see the here, you can see these sort of protrusions here, the sort of weird kind of shaping all over the rocks. Fascinating, I find this absolutely fascinating and compelling. And this, the beautiful cut doorways. And this is actually the two flower of life carvings here, I don't know if you can see them, which uh, look like they're kind of painted on according to various researchers. Uh, they're not particularly that old, apparently. Where are they? Just here. Those look like two Yeah, they've got, they got like the perfect flower of life, really beautifully done, whoever did them. It's very, very sophisticated. So obviously they had to do it there at the site, and, you know, spend a lot of time doing it. Uh, yeah, and there's a few giant reports as well in Egypt, which kind of interests me, um, being a giantologist. Um, in 1881, um, a row of tombs with prehistoric race of giants had been buried. The largest was 11 feet and one inch tall, which is pretty accurate measurement. It's not just 11 foot, it's actually 11 foot, one inch tall. Seven feet and eight inches, some of them, and so on. Lot. Yes. Uh, when they were reconstructing, um, no, no, yes, that, it's all described here. We've got, we've got a few other examples from Egypt in our research, which is going to be a future book Jim and I, Jim Vieira and I are working on. Um, and this is actually in a polygonal wall around the Osaka um, Palace in Japan. But there's evidence that this was actually a fairly modern construction, just a few hundred years old. Um, and so it's odd that even though they're using some stones that are over 100 tonnes, this was still happening just a few hundred years ago. But other, other researchers believe these are much, much older, but there's actually records stating when these were built, which is, I, th I think is equally interesting. They were still able to do this five or 600 years ago, um, nonetheless. Uh, and even in Osaka, Japan, more stories of giants. Uh, this one's skeleton stands seven feet high. So not huge, but very interesting anomalies here that we find, like evenly worn down teeth, la di da, um, which we do find in North America. But giants linked with very large stones is something we do find all around the world. And the more, I even in North America, uh, Jim and I have discovered a bunch of dolmens um, and slab, large stone slabs linked with giant burials in New England which seems, there's always seems to be to keep finding these connections between large stones and giants, wherever you go, all over the world. This is in Italy, all along the west coast of Italy. You basically, if you head north from Rome, and just cling to the coast. And if you get there, some down south in Napoli and other places as well. Um, lots of harbors are built in polygonal style. There's entire towns that are built within a sort of, uh, almost like a, a circular wall around the whole town, built of that. Massive polygonal blocks, just cyclopean, huge. And then you have these relief carvings above the entrances to some of these places. And this is just an old painting, obviously, some guy's 
just about to use the bathroom there. And um, this is me in Italy. This is one of the walls that is actually part of an old port, which they believe for a long time were, were, was Etruscan, which is a pre-Roman culture, a sort of um, bohemian pre-Roman culture. But there's evidence now of a culture called the Pelasgians, who are prevalent along the west coast as well, and they're much, much older. Uh, a colleague of mine and, and Andrew's, uh, Gary Bilcliffe, has done some superb research along the whole area in Italy, and it's a, a brilliant sites to visit. They're absolutely stunning. Really, kind of whoa! Is this is this for real? Uh, it's just one of the. They also have cyclopean walls, I mean, not polygonal, but just massive chunks of stone, extremely high, extremely going for hundreds of meters, and uh, you can see I was pretty stunned there. Both. And again, we find this, one of the weird things is we do find in Italy is that sometimes you get, you get the beautiful polygonal walls all nicely done, and then you have these cyclopean walls, but then you have cyclopean walls that have just got, just been sliced straight along the edge like that. Just like, it's almost like just a massive blade has gone whoosh, and they're just perfectly straight. You can just sort of look, look at, along it with your eye, and it's unbelievable. And so how, how they did that and why they did that is very intriguing. So a lot of these sites are still here, even though these are old pictures I'm showing you. Uh, no one, no, I don't. Think, not, not hardly any work's been done on it. They just, they just put, say they're Etruscan, which is what's Etruscan? What, uh, 500 to 1000 BC? Is that right, Andy? Something, something like that. Uh, roughly that era. Uh, and we do find more carvings up here above the doorways. These are all relief carvings again. And this is just what, this is one of the, I forget where this is exactly, uh, but this is one of the walls. The whole town was built inside a wall like this, and it was about 50 feet high. And the entire town's still there, and you have to drive through this huge polygonal entrance. It's crazy. And no one knows about these sites. There's me all looking all hooded and everything, like a bad boy. And uh, here's uh, some tall giant skeletons, obviously found in Italy as well, which would suggest that could have been um, uh, who built them. Well, these are obviously different parts of Italy. This is quite a weird one, though. This is, uh, this is potentially just made up, but it's quite interesting. This is 1838. Um, apparently, they were digging down into this, uh, just downwards, making a big hole, and uh, they discovered this tomb with a skeleton and all these strange hieroglyphics. Uh, and it was said to be 11 feet and 4 inches tall, which is uh, particularly, uh, in Italian measure, which is about 10 and a half feet English. So everything's slightly bigger in Italy, apparently. And she shows you the image that went with the news report. And we do find more examples of very nice polygonal work in Albania. Uh, this is in Delphi in Greece. Again, you see that sort of sliced straight wall. It's like a big blade. Sort of <laughs> done, done a nice job on it. This is obviously a major oracle center. Uh, another part of Greece, we find very interesting stonework. Now, I don't know how old these are, really. I mean, th th some of these could be relatively modern compared to some of the older sites we've been looking at, but it's just interesting to just know that they're there, and uh, it's worth checking out, and this, it's an incredibly difficult thing to achieve. And even here in Turkey, we find very interesting stonework. This is um, Hattusa at the top. These are all sort of potentially Hittite sites, although they could be Hattian to an earlier, more sort of pagan culture. And um, this is Alajahuic. No one corrected me, good, good. Uh, even though it's probably pronounced wrong. But this is beautiful. Again, this is polygonal puppy style, almost like we see in Peru. And we took Graham Hancock in, me and Andrew did in 2013. And, were, and even Graham was like, whoa. He was like, he could just be walking around the you know, sites around Cusco. It's so similar. And the size of them is, is remarkable as well. Even though this is um, a more copper age site, which isn't, as old, obviously, as um, anything else, you know, the Gebekli era, obviously, but it's still very intriguing nonetheless. And similar examples here in Hattusa, although not quite as um, irregularly shaped. It's just the entrance to one of the temples at Hattusa. We do actually go here next May, if anyone fancies doing another tour. Um, Oh, and actually, yes, if you, anyone does want to come with us next May, we, we're doing it in two separate parts. You don't have to do the Gebekli bit again. You can not do this part and just do the other part if you fancy it, by the way. And uh, there's Graham looking surprisingly happy there. <laughs> and uh, 
Look at him. He's, he's loving it. Look at him. Yay, come on. And uh, I don't know why this is suddenly in here. <laughs> yeah, I think I got a timeline went a bit crazy. But anyway, let's go to Mexico for a bit. Uh, this is one of the skulls in, um, that came from Leventa. And we find this, these are the very strange jade, jade figurines found at uh, Leventa. Uh, they look kind of almost oriental, but they have elongated heads. These are only about this big, but they're very interesting. Uh, these are at uh, Jalapa Museum. I think they're actually in the, there's copies in the, the main museum in Mexico as well. But you do find very good examples of elongated skulls here. Uh, why that was there, I don't know. And, um, and this is some, rec oops, some recent discoveries in Mexico of elongated skulls in a place called Sonora, which is a vast area. But what I did, I did some research on this. because we've, we've been doing some work here uh, for our, our new book. We've done a whole chapter about Sonora, about the giants that were discovered there 100 years earlier, 80 years earlier, rather, uh, by a guy called Paxton Hayes. This guy here uh, is actually holding one of the robes of the giants. And in, in, a, in a particular area, uh, right in the centre of the Yaki Indian zone, he found hundreds of giant skeletons. He befriended the Yaki, became part of their culture, did all their ceremonies, this, that, and the other, and, um, and, and was able to uncover many, many discoveries down there, which was actually investigated. He was part of the Smithsonian, actually. And then when he was down there, he was a good guy, and uh, he actually got pushed out and ridiculed by the Sm other members of the Smithsonian and got his career virtually ruined. He was like a heretic. He was, he was quite a remarkable chap. We actually met up with his son, pa Carlos Hayes, and he's, he's given us the okay to go down there with him and actually investigate what's called the, um, um, the Lost City of Giants in northern Mexico. So we're very intrigued by this. But what's weird is that these things turned up 20 miles away from the area of the giants. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe how close they were. Literally 20 miles. So it's the same area. It's like one side of San Leofa to the other. It's just the same. And we were like, what? But Paxton Hayes, and we looked through all his stuff, everything he's done, Carlos helped. There's no, not one mention of an elongated skull in his discoveries. So this is a whole different culture buried in a slightly different area, but not part of the Yaki territory. Uh, so we were very surprised by this, but this is just one example. So we're going to go and investigate this hopefully in December. Um, and we'll keep you informed about that. Obviously with the skulls, it's something that Brian Forrest is, um, specializes in. Uh, obviously we have the ones in Malta. These are some other examples from Mexico. This is one that Andrew uh, gave me a picture of. This is incredible, from the Zagros Mountains in Iraq, which is what, 6000 BC or something? Yeah. About that. And, um, and just look at that. Imagine that guy coming at you. Oh my God. And this is uh, Vanuatu, I spot that wrong, in uh, Micronesia. Uh, Ecuador, even Ukraine, you get the Hun, you also get the Huns uh, in Europe, uh, Russia area as well. In North America, we have some examples here. These are probably um, the Chinook, Chinook skulls. Um, with, yeah. With these things, um, skulls of giants, they're not necessarily. Not necessarily uh, that I'm aware of. There want, there's some examples in North America where very tall people had elongated skulls, but that was probably head binding. Uh, there's no precise evidence of them, you know, the, naturally or anything. But I think the cultures, it's almost like there were two elites, the giant elite and the elongated skull elite. It was, that's what I'm, it's difficult to know because there's such a vast timeline and different cultures come and go, eras change, territories and things like this. So it's hard to know exactly what's what, but, you know, Andrew, myself and others are trying to piece some kind of picture together. Uh, I'm focused on the giants at the moment. That's my kind of thing. I just want to kind of get that done with my, my buddy Jim Vieira. Here's some just examples from Peru. This is the classic one of the Ica skulls uh, that come from the whole Paracas kind of area, which is sort of just around Nazca kind of area along the sort of, uh, the sort of desert coast. This is uh, Tiwanaku Puma Punku. This is from Haraz. This is very interesting. If you look at the size of that one compared to that. That looks like a giant to me, I have to admit. And then you have these very strange cleft skulls here, which is like they've been, oh, oops, a daisy. Uh, oops. Uh, which you, get, you kind of get this sort of uh, compression going in here, so it <coughs> expands outwards as well, as well as backwards. So what that would do to your, your brain and your pineal gland and your consciousness, who knows? Um, this here, this guy's a dude, this, I love this guy. 
are kind of inspired by him. That there, that is some serious trepanning was done. He had a massive hole in his head uh, for uh, medical purposes. And then they put a gold plate in it. And then the, 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 the bone grew back around the gold plate. That is ultra bling. And uh, <laughs> if I ne ever need trepanning, that's what I'm getting done. Go with the tooth. And there's just some multiple examples around the world of weird skulls, which I just wanted to throw in there. This guy here is very, very yeah. We actually, we've actually, uh, we've done the whole thing about that in the book. We know exactly where that came from. We all know all the backstory, which I'm not going to tell you now. Uh, here's just some other, just classic, you know, different skulls, different skulls. Like the strange thing with Sumeria, obviously Peru. Um, Hobbit, Lani Da, Star Child Skull. It's very similar to one of these. I don't know why I didn't put it in here. Um, there's an exact, almost like a replica of one of these in the Paracas History Museum, which we go and look at every time we go there. Uh, you've probably seen it, didn't you? Yeah, there's a, you have to pay like 20 bucks just to get a photo of it. But that's, and it's very odd. It's very strange. Oh, okay, that's the end then. Okay, so um, just to summarize, that was my lecture. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to keep it brief and things, and now we just have a quick advert end. This is our conference we're doing. Andrew and I organised this. We'd, if you can come, we hope you can. It's going to be great fun. We've obviously got Mr. Hancock, Danny Hillman, the main dude at Gunnar Badang Skyping in. Jim Vieira is going to be there. He's coming over from America. So me and him are launching our book at the event officially. It'll be out before that, but we're going to officially kind of, that's going to be the official launch of it. Um, this is a tour I'm doing with Brian next February to the Olmec land. Uh, we're going to be doing all the sites around Mexico City, um, uh, including all the Olmec sites on the Gulf Coast and finishing at Palenque. Uh, multiple, we're going to visit everywhere, everywhere Olmec you can think of, plus Tierra Tucan, Tula, um, Quilquilco, Mexico City, uh, various other sites. And these, these are some things, Andrew's involved in many of these. These are some events we're doing next year. So we hope you can stay in touch with us all. Obviously, we've got the next couple of days together anyway. Um, but this is what we're up to. These are the ones I'm doing. Most of these are with Andrew, I think. Uh, Megalithomania, that's our conference we do every May. So if you fancy coming over to England for a few days, we will be doing that. And um, we do lots of tours around the area, around Glastonbury and Stonehenge, Avebury, other sites, Stanton Drew. Uh, this is the India tour Andrew and I are doing. Andrew's got more details about that, but we can discuss that with you later. Obviously, this time next year, Egypt and Baalbek, that's the kind of big one. And a few other things we've got going on. So I hope you can join us. Oh, and there's my new book with Jim Vieira. It's coming out in about three weeks. Yeah, we're still working on the final chapter. <laughs> I'm waiting for Andrew to read through it and give me some advice. <laughs> and that's my other book that came out. I'm just going to keep doing this if you're going to sit there. You can, you can, you can leave if you you can leave if you want. Uh, there's some other bits of Bob's. Some other, that's another book I did a few years ago, which is kind of weird. And uh, got a few DVDs out, and that's it. All right, thank you.